And hey, we got some information on this side. What's going on guys? Welcome back to Classic Octane. I am Taylor. So in today's video, we are going to be pulling the engine out of my black C5 Z06. So first things first, we have to pull the Camaro out. This poor thing has not spent a single night outside in like the six years that I've owned it, but it's gonna have to give up its spot in the garage for a couple of days so we can work on the Z06 because I'm dying to be able to actually drive that thing, do some drift events and go have some fun. So let's swap these two. quick introduction to this project if you're new to the channel and why I need to pull this engine out. So this is a 2001 Z06 I bought from the auction. I bought it wrecked in the uh, right rear. We've already kind of fixed all the suspension and all that stuff in a previous video. I can throw a card up now. I discovered after I bought this uh, that the previous owner supposedly put in a built 408. So I know for sure this has LS3 heads but I don't know anything else about this engine. So it is a complete mystery. So that's one reason why I wanna pull this out so that we can fully inspect it, kind of see what parts are actually in here. If it is in fact a 408 stroker, what kit was used, what cam is in it, all that kind of stuff, just so I know exactly what we are uh, running. Second reason is because there are massive amounts of oil leaks. I know like the front timing cover, possibly the oil pan gasket, um, a ton of leaks all over the place. The underside of this car is just covered in oil. So we have a ton of those to address while the engine is out. And the third and arguably most important uh, reason I wanna pull this out is because we have a really bad uh, kind of clutch engagement noise, uh, like a grinding when you're starting to engage the clutch. Uh, that I believe is the throwout bearing, uh, but I need to get in there and actually inspect it, inspect the clutch itself, make sure it's not slipping or damaged or just misadjusted or whatever, and then um, the condition of that throwout bearing. The uh, car itself has a ton of miles on it, uh, so I'm not uh, gonna be surprised if that throwout bearing is probably original and was never really replaced. So those three reasons are why we're pulling this engine out. Now there's nothing left but to do it. So the drivetrain of these C5s is actually designed to drop out of the bottom of the car, all as kind of one unit. Uh, unfortunately, without a lift, that is just gonna be a really difficult operation. I don't uh, think that I'm gonna be able to get the body high enough to drop the drivetrain out from the bottom and kind of drag it out. So what I'm gonna try and do is actually just pull the engine out of the top. It is pretty far kind of uh, sunk back underneath the firewall, so it might be a little bit difficult. I've only seen a handful of people online that have uh, done it this way. So I'm gonna be a bit of a guinea pig for you guys and I'm gonna take my time and just go through and as I figure stuff out, I'll make sure to kind of document it for you guys and hopefully this will turn into uh, a bit of a how-to video of me showing how at least I did it. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a ton of people that know of a, a better way, but I'm just gonna go with the method I know and that's pulling the engine out of the top. So I'm gonna start with simple stuff like getting the hood out of the way and a lot of the accessories like the intake and I think we're gonna go ahead and pull the radiator out as well. Got the car up on jack stands on the front and my race ramps uh, in the back, so it's nice and level and very sturdy. Went ahead and pulled the hood off uh, to get that nice and out of the way, and then we are just starting to pull stuff off of the engine. So intake's off, working on the radiator now. That's what that sound is, is the coolant is draining out of the bottom. I uh, got the battery pulled as well. Once the radiator is out, I'll be able to determine a little bit more about what I'm gonna actually have to remove. I'm thinking we can probably disconnect and move uh, the rack and pinion forward a little bit, potentially do the same thing with the ABS um, without having to disconnect anything, I'm hoping. I would love to be able to just keep the power steering and the brake lines and everything all kind of self-contained. Uh, my particular car, uh, the 
AC compressor is actually not hooked up because it has an ATI balancer on it. So there's no belt connected to it, but I don't actually know if the AC system is charged or not. So I'm just going to act like it is and try and keep everything intact and not uh, you know, break any lines or puncture uh, the condenser or anything like that. making some good progress. Just got the intake pulled out. Uh, so far, so good. I also have obviously been doing a lot of the electrical connections uh, that you have to get out of the way to be able to uh, get the intake off. So what I'm gonna move on to now is the headers. So these are um, Texas Speed long tubes. So I'm going to unbolt them from the engine, unbolt the center section. I believe the driver side comes out pretty easy um, to be determined on if the passenger side will come all the way out or if it's gonna end up just kind of leaning over and hopefully being uh, far enough out of the way. Little update, I believe I have everything disconnected from the engine. So I went ahead and pulled the valley cover uh, just because that, uh, I think it's the oil pressure sensor, super tall. I feel like it was gonna hit the cowl like really quick. So quick and easy to pull that off. Um, all the wiring I believe is pulled off, starter, all that kind of stuff's out of the way. Just pulled the AC compressor and kind of have it just hanging out next to the block down there. I believe I got all the grounds and everything. I'm trying to think through what else still might be attached. I did also uh, pull out my bell housing bolts as well. Not too terrible to get to uh, on this. I only had four out of five. I found actually quite a few uh, issues with the uh, person who installed this before. A couple of bolts only finger tight, some stuff missing, um, but that's why we're going through it so that I can kind of put my eyes on everything and figure out what was done well and what wasn't. So what I think I'm going to do now is look into what it's gonna take for me to kind of unbolt and slide forward the rack and pinion like I mentioned earlier, because we just have like a half of an inch of this thing to move forward before it hits that. And there's no way we're gonna like disengage the clutch out of the torque tube and stuff in that amount of time. So um, yeah, that's the next thing I'm gonna do. It's the next morning and we're ready to pull this thing out. So. Quickly, a couple of things to go over before we get started. One, I'm gonna be using my load leveler, uh, so that's gonna allow me to have some adjustment in the tilt of the engine as we pull it out. Um, next is going to be where I'm gonna connect that, which I'm just gonna utilize these bolt holes right here on the front of the heads for the front mounts. The rear mounts, I'm going to go off of two of the valley cover bolts in the back here, uh, just because I don't know that I want to bolt to the back of the head because I think our chain will just immediately get into this cowl and it's not gonna give me a ton of adjustment. Ideally, that load leveler is as low as possible to uh, give me as much clearance as I can possibly get. Also give me enough clearance when I come up uh, that I can clear the front of the hood or the front of the uh, bumper and everything to get the actual engine out. I don't wanna run out of uh, vertical space you know, halfway through. So what is the most tricky part of this is if I'm going to have enough clearance to disengage the clutch out of the torque tube before our balancer hits the power steering rack or our oil pan hits uh, the subframe. So that part is, I don't know, some people say it works, some people say it doesn't work. Uh, absolute worst case scenario, we can actually lower the subframe if we need to. Um, I have like a motorcycle jack that shouldn't make uh, make that too terribly difficult, but I'm gonna try it without doing that yet, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Moment of truth, went ahead and pulled out all the motor mounts, uh, bolts and everything, so we should be loose. Let's see, uh, let's see if it moves here. I do wish my engine hoist had like another six inches of reach, because uh, I am Technically touching my fender over here. I don't particularly care on this car, but on a nice car, I wouldn't want to do that. Let's see. Okay. Coming up a little bit. Let me pull it forward if I can.
So I'm gonna get this thing mounted up on the engine stand uh, and I need to pull this clutch off uh, before we can do that. One quick thing on the clutch, I'm gonna have to really inspect it, not only for wear, but mainly to see if we have any oil that got into the friction material, because if it did, unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, a clutch is basically a paperweight at that point. One other thing you eagle-eyed viewers may have already noticed that I just noticed about 45 seconds ago, this doesn't have a C5 oil pan on it. It's supposed to have what's called a bat wing oil pan, which has these like big kind of bat wings uh, off the side. I could show you one on one of my other uh, LSs I have laying around. This just has a regular old rear sump. I don't know if this is a GTO pan or if this is a like F body pan. I don't remember which way the sump is on those, but kind of strange. I don't know why it doesn't have the bat wing. Uh, that could partly be why it was easier to pull out than some people have uh, claimed. I don't know. I'll have to do some research on if that's concerning or not uh, because I haven't heard anyone swapping away from a bat wing and I also have never heard anyone running anything else other than that. So I'm finally able to solve the mystery of what block is in this car. If you remember from um, one of my early Corvette videos, I found the Instagram of the previous owner and it showed him putting in what he called a 408 stroker into this car. And I was a little bit confused because I know 408s are built from six liter blocks, generally like an LQ4 or something like that out of a truck. But I using a magnet determined that this is an aluminum block. So I was really confused about how you get a 408 out of an aluminum block. I know that they made uh, five threes, obviously LS1, which is a 5.7 and then uh, 6.2s, I know they made in all aluminum blocks, but I had forgotten about the LS2, which is what this is. So if you can see right down there, it says 6.0L, meaning it's a six liter, and then using this casting number right here, uh, determines that it is in fact an LS2 block, which is great because I didn't really want an iron block on the front of this thing just for the added weight. Uh, so I like that it has an aluminum block. It also has what we knew about which is the 821 uh, LS3 heads. So really solid uh, foundation. So once we get this thing all cleaned up and not oozing oil out of everywhere, uh, this should be a nice little ripper for sure. More good news, inspecting the clutch, it looks like there is no oil anywhere on the friction material. So these should be good to go. I will uh, look around on this thing and see if I can find a part number, figure out exactly what clutch it is. One, so that we know. And two, I wanna look up what the um, material thickness um, kind of minimum spec is so that I can just double check and make sure there's enough life left in this thing. But so far so good. I'm really happy to uh, not find any oil on there. So the research continues. I figured out this is a Monster SC clutch, uh, which is pretty awesome because it's a, uh, a pretty high end clutch rated for 700 wheel, uh, which is great. And it's also, you know, made for aggressive driving. It even has a check mark next to drift. So. That's sweet, much better than a stock clutch for this application. Uh, looking through the description though, I found something interesting. So if you remember when I mentioned earlier in the video, one of the reasons why we pulled this engine is because I was getting um, a kind of vibration, uh, shuddering kind of um, chatter, so to speak, when we were first taking off. And one of the descriptors on this clutch is it, that it's aggressive and it's not you know, intended for daily drivers if you don't like aggressive clutches. So what do you mean by aggressive? It's going to chatter slash shutter during takeoff. Are you telling me we may have pulled this engine out <laughs> to address a bad throwout bearing when that might just be how the clutch is supposed to be? But not a, not a huge deal. I'm not gonna consider it a fail because we do have so many oil leaks and everything on the engine that we need to address anyway. Also, it was a good learning experience for me if I wanna do competition and uh, these cars, knowing how to pull the engine out. Um, so not a fail, but kind of interesting. I think that might actually be our issue with what I thought was the throwout bearing. I'm gonna see if I can inspect this throwout bearing and see how old it is and see if it's worth replacing anyway, uh, just because we're here. Um, but ideally that's not actually an issue and we can just focus on oil leaks and other stuff.
Believe it or not, Amazon had same day delivery for all of the gaskets I needed. So I ordered them last night at like 4.30 p.m. and they showed up at like 7 p.m. It's pretty wild. Uh, only thing I'm still missing is the oil pan gasket, uh, which should be here sometime today. So we're gonna continue working on this thing. Uh, off camera, I did do a little bit of research and I uh, figured out that this is actually a C6 oil pan, which makes sense uh, with an LS2 block. Those came in the C6 Corvettes in like the first couple of years. So um, we're gonna keep that. There is some debate online of whether the uh, Batwing style intake might actually be better for oil control. We'll just have to keep a close eye on this thing. If I have oiling issues, which LSs are kind of prone to, I will probably run um, like an AccuSump or something like that. Uh, we'll go into those details uh, in the future, but I'd love to run like a dry sump, but uh, definitely not in the budget just yet. One other thing I did off camera because I wasn't sure it was gonna work or not is uh, remove the ATI uh, dampener. The uh, reason I didn't know if that was gonna work or not is because you can't use the traditional crank pulley uh, set that I have. So I have this set right here that I use on all my other LS engines and it works great, but um, you can't actually put a, a jaw around here. You can damage the unit itself. So what I did is just got one of these cheap uh, puller sets and I was able to just run three bolts straight through some holes that were already existing, put some bolts on the end, and in combination with that and my longest little push rod and my other set, I was able to uh, pull that crank, uh, or sorry, that harmonic balancer right off. So no real issues there. Now let's tear into this thing and see what we can find out about it. Get you guys a little bit closer. Uh, so it looks like we do have upgraded valve springs for sure because these are dual valve springs. So it's like a bigger spring on the outside, another little one on the inside. Uh, which these, to the best of my knowledge, did not come factory with dual valve springs. So that's cool. That means that was upgraded alongside with our cam. As far as the trunnions go, these look to be factory. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the aftermarket trunnion upgrades have like little snap rings that hold um, the little bearings in. These look to be just pretty factory. I need to do some research on if the LS3 setup is as prone to issues as like the LS1 and the... Uh, the kind of older style, but everything looks really good in here. No real gunk or grime or anything like that. Looks nice and clean. Sweet. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace these uh, gaskets. One of them, so this side over here is blown out on the back. So I know that was definitely causing some oil uh, problems for sure, but everything else looks great so far. I decided to give the uh, valve covers a coat of paint. Uh, since the like wrinkle red uh, that the previous person put on here was all chipping off and it looked really bad. I uh, just pulled off the water pump, all that looked normal. I have already noticed that we are missing a bolt for our front timing cover. This is the side of the engine that had the most oil on it. Hard to believe that all of it would come from this, um, but it certainly doesn't help. So I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday or not, but I found at least a handful of things with this car where some corners were definitely cut. Uh, things that were, you know, hand tight, like uh, one of the bell housing bolts was hand tight. The, one of the power steering uh, kind of bracket bolts was hand tight. There's just a lot of things that uh, were kind of not done to uh, the highest degree of quality, and which is, uh, you know, makes me feel better about going through it myself so that we can double check everything before we really put this engine through its paces. With uh, the parts we found so far, LS2 block, all that stuff, I mean this engine is very quickly um, becoming much more valuable than the car itself, uh, which is great. So I, I want to make sure we do everything we can to not hurt it. Unfortunately there is no identifier or anything on the front, so I do want to go ahead and pull the cam all the way out. We can inspect the lobes and everything uh, too while it's out as well. I don't want to pull it out with the engine in this configuration though, because the lifters can fall down. So I actually need to flip the engine all the way over. So once you have all the rocker arms loose, you want them extremely loose. I leave them on just so that I don't have to keep track of them. Uh, but you want them like maybe a thread holding on. How you know if they're loose enough, take two water pump um, mounting bolts, put them into the can and you should be able to freely spin the cam over by hand, just like this. If it's like going and hitting, then you still have a lifter that's contacting. Uh, so you wanna spin it a couple of times to make sure all the lifters are pushing down. None of them are gonna get in the way. And then we are ready to 
slide this baby out. And this is a, a delicate operation as well because you don't want to nick any of these cam bearings. Just like that, she's out. And hey, we got some information on this side. It is a Texas Speed. We have 229, 244 duration, 629, 615 lift on a 112 LSA. That's pretty aggressive. Um, I don't think you can run much over like 630 something, 640 lift, something like that on LS3 heads. So 229, 244, 629, 615. This thing should make some some grunt for sure. Went ahead and threw the cam back in uh, just because there's no reason for us to keep it out at this point. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull this oil pan off and we're gonna look down and see if we see any identifiers whatsoever on crank, rods, pistons, anything we can see from underneath uh, to try and figure out if this does in fact have a stroker kit and if so, if we can figure out what brand uh, so I can try and uh, look up some details, that would be great. So let me zip this oil pan off. Looking through here, everything looks really good. I don't particularly see any real identifiers. I was hoping to see like a stamp on the side of the connecting rod that said like, you know, Eagle or whatever, just so I can try and have a little bit more information. Uh, one thing I am noticing is everything in here is ARP hardware. We have ARP 2000 for the uh, cap bolts, all of these uh, main bearing, what are these things called? Whatever these like main studs are all ARP, the head studs are also ARP. So this thing is pretty well built. I'm uh, very pleasantly surprised. All of it looks nice and clean in here as well. Success, so I was able to use a mirror and look at the side of a connecting rod and uh, there's big Lunati right on the side of it and uh, a part number. And when I Google that part number, it leads me straight to this, which is a Lunati 408 stroker kit for the LS2. All that matches the part number and everything's exactly the same. ARP 2000 bolts, I mean, everything matches exactly with the, all the information that I can find. So I'm quite confident this is exactly the kit we have in this engine, uh, which is sick. This is a uh, 10.3 to one compression, it looks like. It looks like the rotating assembly and everything is rated for 1200 horsepower, which is nuts. I don't, uh, I don't think these LS2 aluminum blocks are rated for that, but uh, pretty awesome that our full forged rotating assembly. I mean, this thing, that with that big Texas Speed Cam 408 stroker, there's no reason why this thing shouldn't easily be able to put out 500 plus wheel horsepower in the Corvette, which uh, it's gonna be enough for a beginner drifter like me, I think. Well guys, I could not be happier with how this whole thing turned out. From the ease of pulling the engine, I think it took me right about six and a half hours or so, and that's having never done it on a Corvette before. Uh, completely by myself and also taking my time. So I'm really stoked about that. And then it's been nothing but good news after that. The clutch is in really good shape. It's a high-end monster clutch rated for, what was it, seven or 800 horsepower, which would be plenty for what we're gonna do. It's also uh, designed for drifting, which is incredible. Uh, the engine itself has been all great news. I mean, dual valve springs, big Texas speed cam, Lunati 408 stroker kit. I uh, need to look up some videos online and see if I can figure out what realistic horsepower expectation I should have for this. But I mean, I would be hard pressed to think that this thing doesn't make north of 600 crank horsepower. I don't know how it couldn't uh, with 400 plus cubic inches and all that cam and everything. Uh, so I'll try to look that up and see um, I also think it would be cool to dyno this thing at some point. I don't know, I'm getting ahead of myself. So overall, really ecstatic about this. I'm not gonna take you guys through the process of putting it all back together because it's literally just the reverse of what you just saw me do. Uh, also, my oil pan gasket isn't here yet, so I'm gonna have to wait for that anyway. So I appreciate you guys watching this one as always. I know you guys were very patient about more Corvette content. Uh, I have a buddy coming over this weekend and I'm gonna have him uh, help me put this thing back in the car. Uh, I'll turn the camera on and make sure we capture uh, all of that, but uh, hopefully it goes nice and smooth. So appreciate you guys watching as always and I'll see you on the next one.